So up next, we have Matilda Waisaki. She'll be presenting Network Social Movements Before, Besides, and Beyond the Internet. So please welcome her. Hey, y'all. I'm Matilda. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, so, I'm a computer science student. Um, I do arts and uh, I'm a community organizer. So, I've worked around homelessness. I've worked around uh, climate and disability justice. I've just started doing all the things with the uh, Poor People's Campaign um, in New York. So, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about how we can uh, better connect with social movements when we try to design our new networks. Um, the shortcomings that we might have in uh, making them uh, without looking at history and uh, the way that we can hopefully uh, um, make them match our values. So, there's already a brief history of the internet. I'm going to try to give an even briefer one. Uh, a lot of the uh, infrastructure that we work with is uh, uh, based on the uh, uh, ARPANET, uh, which was the first um, uh, model to use uh, TCP and IP protocols. Um, although there is uh, apparently debate around this still, um, it's uh, pretty clear that the research into uh, trying to create a robust communications infrastructure that could survive a uh, nuclear war uh, led to a uh, highly modular design. So if there are a few nodes that got to die, they die. Um, and this has been carrying over to this day and uh, how applications and people are accessing the internet. So, um, a paper that uh, I've been drawing from is uh, um, Tara McPherson's uh, paper on the intersections of uh, Unix and attitudes towards race uh, from the late 60s onwards. Uh, Unix was designed to uh, obscure complexity um, and embrace modularity. Um, I made sure to take, uh, take that model and uh, see where they were doing the comparisons with race because it seemed by and large very similar to the way ARPANET was designed. Um, and we are uh, facing the same issues that modularity today when uh, people's identities are quickly obscured in networks as people's uh, news feeds, uh, people's uh, um, searches are mediated uh, by uh, what they were doing before. You don't know what you don't know and you never will know what you don't know in the end. Um, and if there are people who are being ignored or are uh, hurt. Uh, if you aren't, uh, as Kate was talking about yesterday, the ideal user, uh, in many ways you might not even be there for others. And um, with respect to race, this came in, in as second wave feminism was starting to uh, take hold um, and um, you had to either be anti-racist or uh, uh, anti-patriarchy. You couldn't be both. Um, uh, different social movements were competing to try to gain traction. Um, they were all uh, becoming modular, discreet, unable to uh, work in coordination as time went on. And it's where a lot of uh, um, people fail to work together. We've tried to come up with new frameworks uh, like intersectionality to address this, but in many ways, we're still seeing these um, closed-off attitudes towards uh, social justice in many movements. 
uh, in practice, if not in theory. We aren't intersectional, not yet, for the most part. And that's where the promise of interconnectivity came in. Uh, earlier on in the 60s, there was uh, this guy. Um, Martin Luther King is uh, very, very well regarded in America. Um, he's uh, well known for being a civil rights activist, um, bringing uh, uh, new rights to uh, the bear for people who weren't getting them uh, in practice, weren't getting America's promise fulfilled, uh, and um, essentially a teacher slash ancestor in the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, a lot of our teachings are drawn from his work, and he was far more radical than anybody will give him credit for. Um, but anyways, um, he was uh, emphasizing the need to work with others uh, who are suffering and to uh, find collective liberation. Uh, you couldn't do uh, your own work, you couldn't achieve your own ideals without working to help others achieve theirs. And in many ways that seems to be where the some have romanticized the promise of the internet. We're all going to be connected. We all can do things together now. But um, in many ways, we've been ignoring the connections that he might have saw in the past, the ones that we were working with anyways, the ones that we can use to uh, build new models for ourselves, or just uh, learn from the past and maybe find what we need for the present moment, uh, adapting as we go along. Not necessarily erasing the past, building the future, like some people out on my country's west coast would say. Now this brings me to uh, uh, where the, his, the military origins of the internet don't really mesh well with activists' work. A lot of us are coming from a uh, a uh, place where we were oppressed, uh, we were working mm, for uh, our own well-being, but we couldn't. Um, uh, if we were working within the frameworks that were provided to us. Uh, if we couldn't vote, uh, then the system was lopsided. Even if we did, then the system wouldn't really let us in. Uh, we can't necessarily use the tools that were put against us. Uh, and this lovely little quote by Audre Lorde, uh, who was uh, my introduction to intersectional work, um, encompasses that. But um, a lot of people seem to have taken it as we just can't use any of these tools anymore. We can't have nice things, right? So. Um, the solution there is to go back, see where we can reclaim some of these technologies, see where their ideas are going to fit our needs and where we might have used them before, and then start working from there. Now, again, I'm an organizer. Um, I limited to experience in America, specifically New York. And I'd love to hear about any of y'all's experiences in other places as well. And if you uh, can give me uh, um, information on movements I might not be able to cover today, or I might not have been thinking about, please do so. I was initially going to cover four movements. I'm only going to be able to cover one now, uh, because time. So. I don't think I'm able to do this justice. Um, but basically, um, as an organizer, a lot of what uh, the internet offers is a problem for me because I'm not really able to build relationships where I need to with it. Um, building a relationship uh, far away in, say, Berlin um, might not necessarily be meeting the needs of my community. So uh, how am I going to be able to do it without uh, building out 
uh, any kind of uh, on the ground relationship, um, especially where I'm going to avoid just obscuring information, obscuring people around me. Uh, the most challenging part of the work I've done is trying to leave no one behind. I've made a lot of compromises in the people I've met with, um, people I've tried to help uh, train into leaders, and the people I've uh, tried to appeal to to get things done. But even so, um, trying to obscure what the internet would obscure for me if I was to use it is not an option, ever. So, uh, there is a way to go back into networks without looking at uh, the internet. Social networks have been a thing for a while, and yeah, not Facebook, not Twitter. Social networks. How do we connect with each other? Um, we were doing this before we were on the internet, we're going to be doing it afterwards. We wouldn't be able to get on the internet if we didn't have a community that was strongly tied to the internet. I wasn't really doing much on the internet until I got to college because it just wasn't really a part of uh, what we did where I was, like at all. Maybe I'd go on for uh, whenever I had internet permissions at school, but it just wasn't there. So I want to use social networks first and then build up to computer networks. So, um, a lot of people um, that I've worked with uh, have had trouble with managing applications. Uh, Slack is too complicated, Twitter is too complicated, uh, Asana is too complicated. And a lot of these applications weren't really built for us. We can use them and it works if we work hard at getting them right. But a lot of us want to make our own tools. Um, a really, really cool organization um, in the US, techactivist.org, um, found that out of the 2,000 people they worked with, almost every one of them wanted to build their own tools, take matters into their own hands, and couldn't. Um, a big part of the application layer's design is that it can be uh, general enough for people of all different political strands to use it, or, uh, or so the intention was. But this uh, false neutrality has uh, let it to easily be co-opted by those who have more rights at the server level, the people who decide what can get uh, published, what identities are valid, what permissions people using uh, data on the servers have. And this exposes people who are more susceptible to uh, risk um, to uh, having their uh, data sold, uh, to uh, not getting the information they need by having it obscured, uh, or being profiled, which happened to many people, particularly uh, homeless folks, uh, where I was organizing. So I'm going to be talking about the civil rights era, uh, mainly because it's what we've talked about in uh, my organizing tradition. It's where I've been trained. Um, but what's fascinating about it is the uh, way that different groups with different interests were able to uh, not necessarily work towards a common goal, but work towards a common good. Uh, they didn't ignore each other, and even if they didn't communicate and collaborate, they still knew how to get things done alongside of each other. You had Malcolm X uh, working in when Martin Luther King was working. Both of them uh, were extreme in their own ways. Uh, Malcolm was seen as the more extreme one, and that allowed King to uh, gain the uh, reputation as the uh, sane choice, the uh, lesser of evils, which, which isn't true, but it was what was needed to uh, get uh, the white moderate to uh, um, become sympathetic to the civil rights movement, which uh, drove it forward uh, in the courts and in elections. 
and you also had people fighting um, the uh, internal dynamics of these groups uh, from within and forming their own organizations. Ella Baker, who you will be seeing on the on my uh, left here, was one such person and is probably the biggest influence on how I've done my work. We're trained in her tradition. But um, the coalition building um, that MLK emphasized was um, adaptable. It allowed people to work together effectively. Um, e and e when they didn't agree, it also meant that they could uh, transfer or information to each other and not keep incomplete pictures. Um, as as uh, he got deeper and deeper into his work, he started focusing on economic justice and forming coalitions with workers um, in uh, disadvantaged areas. And this meant that uh, he was expanding his base, expanding who was included in his movement. And it allowed uh, the information bubbles that might come from identifying with a certain group to burst. But it, these coalitions by themselves also led to his identity being hijacked. Um, connecting isn't necessarily a good thing by itself. Being connected to the world doesn't mean that your identity is safe. So this is where Ella Baker came in. Uh, her work emphasized um, the decentralization a lot of people in blockchain space love to talk about. Um, but she formed the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, in the face of discrimination from uh, many people in Martin Luther King's organization, which she helped start, but she didn't really get credit for. And uh, through her work, um, the organizer, in essence me, or anybody else in my role would go behind the scenes and try to train other leaders in a given community to uh, take their work uh, and uh, build power on their own terms, uh, giving them um, the rights to decide what happens, what doesn't as a group, both individualists and collect activists at the same time and ready to connect with others. So what have we been getting from the internet so far? Um, a whole lot of uh, the work that was done on with computer networks uh, allowed people to connect faster and in real time. So during uh, the uh, protests in Ferguson, you had Palestinian activists communicating with the people uh, on the ground in Ferguson over tips on uh, how to uh, face the police, how to avoid getting in, uh, tear gassed, uh, uh, how to avoid um, aid, uh, being detained. Uh, you had this solidarity that couldn't have been formed uh, with the, with the, without the internet, without that instantaneous or near instantaneous uh, relationship across space. And while we want to uh, keep those connections being formed, uh, having that closed uh, system that um, computation um, and the networks that it runs on provides doesn't necessarily give you a view of what's happening on the ground. I think of D. Ray McKesson's uh, campaign in, in Baltimore. Uh, he was able to get uh, hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers, but it didn't translate into votes. So uh, there were there were very, very uh, skewed projections on uh, how well he would do in the race. Uh, so being able to expand beyond the netosphere is um, important, or having a grounding in uh, outside of uh, this discrete world is essential. And that's why a, any kind of uh, network infrastructure uh, for activists needs to be designed from the protocol layer up. Uh, most people aren't able to work with it. I have trouble setting up routers. Uh, 
frankly. And uh, the control it allows is subtle. Alexander Galloway, whose excellent book, Protocol, likens it to a speed bump rather than and an overhead traffic camera. Um, it still controls you even if you don't necessarily know it. And there is an implicit agreement when you use it. Uh, if you're connecting with someone else uh, via the internet, uh, you're going to be uh, sharing a protocol. You're sharing a set of uh, uh, instructions, rules to work with. Um, and being able to agree upon them between contexts, so between different groups, local or global, is essential. So um, even if you have a governing body like W3C, uh, you're not necessarily going to have the support that you want just from the protocol level unless you are taking an active role in maintaining it. So what is to be done? Well, I've just started my research. I'm trying to get into topology so that I can understand uh, how to model the networks themselves uh, from uh, previous movements and how it would translate to internet infrastructures. But developers uh, have other work to do as well. I'm, uh, there's Beaker Browser, a great project that tries to give server-based rights to uh, people right in their client. So you get an easy ability to publish, uh, set permissions. You get ability to uh, control your own identity and decide which software you're using and make updates on an as-needed basis. But um, you also want to control uh, who gets internet and who doesn't. Uh, right near where I go to school, in Hunts Point, uh, mesh networks are being set up right now uh, to enable this kind of communal control. But um, really, I can't really give any hard um, protocol advice, not just because um, I'm not like a super, super, uh, um, protocol savvy at this point, but mainly because I am an organizer and I'm trying my best to listen rather than speak. So this is a little weird for me. I still have a lot to learn between contexts, um, what people want, what people need to work with. And that's kind of why I wanted to uh, speak to y'all about this today, so that hopefully some of y'all would be willing to uh, do this work with on the ground activists as well. Um, and building those relationships um, doesn't really have a silver bullet or a panacea. You just got to be able to go out there and listen. So uh, that's all for now. I've got my references pooled up right in there. So uh, let's talk. Or comments, I was kind of hoping we could do a little stack, um, which uh, in my experience tends to lead to more discussion. So like maybe three or four people will be called on. They can ask questions or respond to each other. Um, and me, I would go at the end of maybe those three, respond to everyone. So meep, meep, and uh, uh, wait, so first Thank you. Um, one of the constants that I've kind of noticed between my experiences being a part of Occupy um, in America and now uh, the fuck off Google protest here is that one of our greatest strengths is diversity of people and skills and mindsets, which, right, as, as humanity, that's one of our great strengths. And yet, when this gets applied to a specific topic, like in Occupy's case or this case here, People say, oh, yeah, I kind of agree with the cause, but I think the way everybody's going about it's wrong. And I really like that I think two or three slides said the imperfections or the you know, chaoticness of the civil rights movement, 
which I have not researched nearly enough, but that's super inspiring to me because I found that, you know, like in Occupy, I started redoing the website and then some other kid in the group was like, yeah, you see the site was down today? And I was like, yeah, he's like, yeah, I DDoSed it. And I'm like, why would you do that? But it was like this chaos and yet it was an interesting conversation. And yet there's challenges at this vertices that I keep encountering. So I don't know, like it's a topic, it's a hurdle. What are your experiences, if not with that, et cetera? Do you want to answer it now? Do you want to answer that now? Okay, so um, honestly, um, my own experiences here have been uh, as, well, I've tried to be the smoother over because you have a lot of people with a lot of interests uh, uh, working and they're off been turned against each other by whatever system we're fighting. For example, when I was trying to uh, organize uh, to uh, help get a shelter cap, uh, the number of people to shelter or, um, to increase, um, I would uh, have to deal with uh, the uh, way that shelters distribute resources and how it creates competition amongst uh, people staying inside which often led, led to a racism, sexism, uh, things that would make the spaces that I was working in uh, unsafe for many, so I would have to uh, push people out if I couldn't work to uh, help them uh, where they were. And it means compromise, and it means I, can't, I do have to leave some people behind. Um, the important thing was that we weren't being turned against each other, but we were not cutting corners with uh, each of our individual situations. A lot of the people that I would work with um, out in the open were men because a lot of women didn't feel safe in the open, uh, let alone people who were uh, trans. And you have to find a way around that. You have to go to... Um, uh, meet people where they are in their spaces. I'm just starting at a space where I'm uh, working in uh, self-defense and learning self-defense myself as a trans person. I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment, but what I am interested in is the f statistic of 97% of people working in um, social justice roles, having wanting to build their own tools. Um, we've heard a lot from various people, um, not just here, but also um, on a broader, in a broader context. And I, I've, I think there's this interesting sort of, I guess, weakness of current technologies where like, there's some really elegant stuff being built. I mean, Beaker Browser is an example, but there's many others, some of which we've seen today. And yet, there's that, that ubiquity that feels like we need to reach. And that ubiquity, if you think about, for example, building your own tools, there still doesn't exist good ways for people with limited um, computer science knowledge to actually build their own tools. And even if you do have, I mean, I've been um, professionally developing for eight years and I still find it unbelievably taxing, right? So I find it very difficult to combine that with other work that I want to do. It's very difficult to do both at once. And so I guess, I'm interested in in a discussion around how ubiquity, how how we can replace some of the stack lower down um, in in ways that really empower people, and where where those moments happen where we could roll it out. I mean, even like alternate operating systems or things like that that give people tools that they can use to to um, build better things by themselves. I know that's a bit of a mind dump. I'm sorry. Do you want to respond or? Okay. It's since we had only two at the time, we'll work this way for now, I guess. Um, yeah, so I'm still struggling with uh, how I can uh, get people more interested in uh, working or configuring the tools um, that we use uh, every day. Because frankly, it becomes hard to uh, 
just not pick one and settle, especially when you're always trying to move when you just need to get things done. There's not as much time for reflection and uh, deliberation on which features we need and which ones we don't need. Um, uh, I guess the technical debt, um, if you want to call it that, from uh, cutting corners on what features we try to use comes way after when we finally get a chance to reflect. And that's something I'm still trying to work around. Um, as for uh, finding a way to make the lower level more accessible, I think we need to uh, uh, try to uh, make uh, tools like Beaker, um, not necessarily Beaker itself. It's a browser, um, and it does give you control over uh, features that were normally limited to servers, but it doesn't really go beyond that. Um, being able to understand operating systems, uh, security. Um, these seem to be hard problems, and I'm, I'm still struggling to think about them right now. Yeah, hi. Um, you said something interesting about um, not working towards a common goal, but working towards a common good. That sounds really nice, but I don't know what that looks like or what, what, it, look, what it was in, in, in practice. Like, it, could you maybe refer to an example? So we've got something to like apply that wasn't in the 50s? Because I really like the idea, but can't really picture it yet. The example I used was um, referring to specifically to Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and the dynamic they had. They famously never really talked. Um, there's like a picture of them just seeing each other once, but um, I am yet to find anything about them talking um, that's actually real. Um, but they had different goals. Uh, uh, Malcolm was uh, uh, trying to uh, um, use any means necessary, um, violence even to um, advance the uh, uh, goals of his community. Martin Luther King was not. The, Martin Luther King uh, wanted to uh, fulfill America's promise. Malcolm X uh, was seeking to break away from uh, its system and what it was doing. And you'll see and not just with these groups, you'll see people uh, using different methods at the local level as well. The Deacons for Defense was essentially doing vigilante work. They saved somebody that I was, uh, is in class with in the past, like way back in the 60s, uh, by using violence. Um, it took different people doing different things and having different goals. But uh, even then, um, the way that everyone else saw them uh, determined how they would react to um, the movement as a whole. So seeing Malcolm X uh, meant that uh, Martin Luther King was seen as the moderate one, the safe one, which meant that uh, his demands were more likely to be met, and that meant that uh, um, there was some progress made. By no means perfect, but it was there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I was just thinking while I do, um, I guess, agree that there are some key uh, differences between the approaches of Malcolm X um, and Martin Luther King, I also want to consider um, how there's also these narratives that were created uh, around them that maybe um, are less authentic to their actual message. So thinking about how Martin Luther King was, um, like, the way that we learn about him, at least in like a US context, um, is, um, paints him as much more passive than he actually was. Um, and we don't learn in, in school K through 12 in the US about um, his critiques on capitalism or his like um, uh, on US imperialism 
Um, and so one of the things that I'm thinking of that, I don't know if this is really a question, but, um, and you s sort of mentioned this um, in your, um, in your presentation, but how um, often we see these uh, like one, um, so like someone like Martin Luther King uh, can be painted as this like one central, um, I don't know, like, yeah. Um, and uh, that a movement can uh, can depend so much on only one person, and I and I wonder how much of that is is uh, created by people who are in who are actually a part of these movements and who are doing um, who are doing all of this other labor that goes uncredited, um, and how much is how much that narrative is shaped by those who are in opposition to that movement. So like, for example, like if the civil rights movement was reliant only on Martin Luther King and he could be killed, then it's like, what, like, it, so it, I guess if that narrative comes more from like, yeah, folks who are in, um, who, who have, who can gain something by, by, um, I guess like just removing this person who's painted as this like singular revolutionary as if like a revolution can be dependent only on one person. Uh, and then another thing that I'm thinking of um, just in terms of like coalition building uh, in your presentation is on the um, Black Panther leader Fred Hampton um, who uh, worked a lot with um, who worked with like the Young Lords, who I believe were like a Puerto Rican um, uh, group, and then uh, with like poor like white working class and like um, like Asian American groups, and was like I guess one of the reasons why he was seen as so dangerous and like what ultimately like led to his like murder was because he was doing coalition building across all these different racial groups. Um, sorry, this isn't really a question. I, I don't, <laughs> but yeah. What was then talked was incredibly revisionist in some ways because of the deep strategy and organizing of the networks that was required by the references presented. And the ways that they were presented were very this like great man theory, which is very pervasive in like heteronormative capitalism and theories of social change. It was like, oh, is that one dude? And not all the care work and the labor that had to go into like even allowing like parents to cross across a bridge. Like no one talks about the child care that was necessary to allow that to happen. Uh, and I think that those types of narratives actually do a disservice to the type that we're trying, the type of work that we're trying to do um, as social movements that are present right now. So I appreciate you taking the time to dissect that. All right, well, do, do you want to comment on that? And then, all right, and then we'll wrap it up. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You're right. That's kind of why I was trying to get into Ella Baker's work. Um, because uh, we were trained in her tradition uh, as a strict defiance towards uh, uh, great man theory. Um, in her biography, I remember her saying, the movement made Martin, not Martin the movement. Um, in many ways, he was selected uh, because he was presentable. Um, and um, there was a fair bit of elitism within the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference that um, allowed this uh, respectability to uh, uh, come to the forefront. And she couldn't really take it, and rightfully so. Um, it allowed his identity he, as an activist and the good he did do to be co-opted and associated with passivity, in my opinion. Um, just by reaching out, you don't necessarily get uh, to make everything all rosy. Um, that's why having people who are uh, uh, working on the fringes, working in the margins, um, is so important and that's why they need to be acknowledged. 
I really wish I could have gone deeper into this. It feels really weird to talk about this in 20 minutes, frankly. But that was my hope anyways, just was to say, yeah, you can connect, you can reach out, you can form a coalition, but maybe you'll just be used more than uh, you want in doing so. And we're trying not to do that with the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, they've been welcoming to me. They're the, f the first group to really acknowledge my disabilities. Uh, even when their goals don't mention disability explicitly, I found a place in it. And that's why I want to do everything I can to help everyone else in it uh, with whatever they have to face, too. Thank you so much.